And today in this set, I've got a guy who's kind of like put me under his wing in terms of, you know, they talk about all of those things that they talk about, you know, having a power team. And this guy here has kind of like put all of my troubles away by putting me under his wing. He's a lawyer. So um, I do not want to waste any time because we've got lots of things to learn. Um, I have known him, it's almost three, going to our fourth year. I think 2016 uh, somewhere, yeah. Correct, yeah. And I thought, well, let's bring in Bruno on here to see who is this guy uh, that is so intelligent that keeps me out of trouble and makes sure that all the deals are running smooth. And this is Bruno Samawa from Bruno Samawa Tennis. Bruno, how's it going? Hey, DJ. Thanks for having me on. It only took four years, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> good, man. Good. It's good to have you around. Um, and Bruno, in a snippet, who are you and what do you do? Um, all right. So is that the existential version or do you want the summary? <laughs> um, so Which version do you want us to know? <laughs> well, how much time do we have? I think I could, I could carry it on for about 45 minutes. Yeah. Um, but no, on a, on a serious note, I'm, it's, it, it's quite interesting because my different, um, it's so difficult to define and actually say who I am um, because of the different things that we do. And I mean, you would experience this firsthand as well, having been in different industries and then jumping into property. Um, so for, um, from, from my side, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm an entrepreneur by heart, always a businessman. Um, I've been doing it for years. In stark contrast to that, I'm an attorney. And believe it or not, being an attorney and being a businessman are two very, very different things. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm an attorney as of our occupation. At home, I'm a family man, uh, yeah. which is, is one hell of a balance to reach um, when you're doing the other two. And then together with that, obviously, all is like looking for adventure and challenges. Uh, so from a... a, 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 a um, characteristic perspective or trade perspective that's who i am um, i spend most of my time as an attorney and businessman been doing it for about what 12 yeah, 12 13 years now uh property industry for almost a full 12 13 years love it i love the challenge i love the people in it because it takes a very specific type of person to realize the importance of investing in properties and having those guys as my clients believe it or not is actually fun it's a challenge don't get me wrong yeah. it's a real yeah. challenge but it's it's a lot of fun awesome bruno you you married um like you said, you're a family man and um, you've got you've got one kid, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, two kids, yeah. Two kids, right? Yeah. Um, one newly born, I think. They were what, a year, a year old or so, or just below? It, it, it's crazy how time flies. So now he turned two in December 2019, so he's about two and a half now. Okay, good. Um, and having said that, Bruno... <clears throat> there's there's lots of things you you are in the office for very long hours you know i mean i i know that when i come to your office sometimes you are you're picking up noodles you're picking up this and it's like four o'clock and i'm like saying bruno are you not going home and you're like yeah i am going to go but you know i swing by your office the lights are still on at a weird hour mm. um I just wanted to understand, Bruno, when you started off, you know, you started law, that's your thing that you started off. But when you branched off to go into studying, mm. was property the thing or was law the thing and property came after? Okay. No, that's, that's actually a brilliant question. Um, so problems were the thing. Um, I've, always, I've always been uh, attracted to some level of problem solving or um, a career in problem solving so sure. I've, I've always worked within the it space as well when i was younger i used to love messing around um and it was always about solving problems finding solutions and then law just kind of creeped up on me and when i looked at it and i saw the potential like what you can actually do and it's right. always one of those fields that are so uncertain no one really knows what's happening and I decided I want to understand this. I want to understand it. I want to specialize in it. I want to master it. And I want to be able to solve all sorts of problems. And obviously, when you're young, you think you're going to solve every problem in the world like that. But it, it's definitely a career path 
in problem solving. That that was my niche. Yeah, the, so that that comes in with with a different kind of characteristics or behavior. Um, you know, when I was employed, um, I used to practice change management. You know, so my background is psychology. And and in practicing that, I needed to continuously learn new things uh, for me to be able to harness that. And what I see a lot is, especially with newbies coming in into uh, into the property space, um, they tend want to go into their lawyer that they know or a family lawyer. I always give an example of a family lawyer, and I say, don't go and speak to a family lawyer about this deal because it's not going to fly. Mm. In your perspective, having now gone through law is the law that we know, and now you're practicing and you're specializing in property, because that's what I know you for. I've never heard you going to say that you're doing to go for a criminal or you're going to marry some people I haven't in the last four years that you've been in charge. Why have you specialized? So number one, why did you specialize in property? And number two, what does it actually take to specialize in property? So uh, to answer your first question, why property? Um, again, it goes back to the characteristics of those clients. Yeah. Um, it's entrepreneurial clients. So I actually started the property journey uh, with, I was doing my article, so I knew nothing wet behind the ears. It was a general practice, so they did everything. I got exposure to collections, to divorces, to criminal, you name it. Yeah. And then the property clients interested me because they always came to me. So there was an investment. They saw value in what they were, uh, th what they were buying. There was all the, every single property had to be dealt with differently, uh, right. different approaches to everything. Um, and then the solutions that you had to come up with to try keep the investment viable. Because, um, so when I started practicing in property, um, I call it the, the darker side of property for, for lack of better words. And it was the clients that used to attend all the sales and execution. And those were, those, it's a very different style of, of property law, but it, it teaches you a lot because you, you always confronting people in, at, at multiple, at multiple stages or. Uh, there's always confrontation at some point. There's always a problem that needs to be solved. And, but the interesting th thing is if you dug all that away, which is the reason why they gave it to me. So they didn't want to deal with it. That's why I existed. So I dealt with the problems. I've got what I wanted. But if you right. looked at these clients and their persona, the characteristics, their mindset, it was incredible because the way that they approach the deals, their decision-making, their development over a couple of years, because I've seen a lot of people come and go. I've had clients that succeeded, clients that don't succeed, clients that take big chances, clients that are very conservative. Um, so it's a world of experience, so many different people doing so many different things in different ways. And you look for certain common traits on the successful ones, the guys that take the chances, like the drivers in the industry. Um, and you actually find, surprisingly enough, that those are the guys that actually place a lot of reliance on me because they, they understand the compliment. And they understand that they don't want to be sitting down worried about the details. They want to say, I want to achieve X and you do it. I don't care how you do it. I don't care how you word it, but you go off and do it. And when I'm done, this is how we're going to do, uh, do it. So they've got that mindset where they don't try structure their, their commercial feasibility or the commercial dealings within the law. They want the deal to look a certain way yeah. and they expect somebody else to make the law fit into that. And it's a characteristic that I actually find works. And uh, these guys take chances. They're willing to confide in their attorney or, you know, whoever it is. But they find innovative ways of making money. And over the years, like I've had a client now for 11, 12 years. And you've just seen a remarkable development from where he started to the amount of properties that he owns right now and the amount of money that he has and freedom yeah. that he has. It's incredible. Yeah. I think I know that guy's name is TJ. Yeah. <laughs> no, you definitely one of them. <laughs> I think there's power in that, Bruno. Um, I think when we don't know what we don't know, uh, that I think I always say that if we don't know what we don't know, that's being in a very bad space. Um, for me, back in the days when people would talk about a lawyer, automatically 
the evil side of me or the dark side of me would come up <laughs> and say, Whoa, that guy is yeah. expensive, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. But now, having worked through with you in so many of the deals that we're doing, I realize in the partnerships that we are involved in mm. is that it's actually more deadly not having mm. someone like you on my team because what I don't know is actually going to kill the deal or kill the relationship later. Or if things go wrong, how can I get out of it, but get out of it clean or get out of it with something? Um, and that's where I'm seeing the, the value of a person like you. Um, but Bruno, you have an unfair advantage. Oh, yeah. And that fair, unfair advantage is that number one, you, you're still a property, um, you, you're still a property lawyer, yeah. right? And you specialize in it, it's your comfort space. And number two, you're a businessman, so you're always looking out for opportunities as well. Yeah. Um, and I have seen one or two deals that you're also pushing, so which means that you also do deals on your own, you know, deals that Absolutely. you want to do and do. Um, why, why is that? Is practicing not enough for you? Or is there something <laughs> else that you see in the property space that where you now start getting involved? Um, well, that's the same as me asking, wasn't your previous job enough for you? <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's the challenge. At the end of the day, it's diversifying yeah. um it's it, you know hedging your bets like no one knows what's going to happen tomorrow with the law firm but right. um or no one knows what's going to happen with property uh, the opportunity is there so it'd be stupid not to take it right. um but but now bear in mind I, unfair advantage it may be true but the reality as well is also like if you look for example within the sapper networks a lot of the opportunities actually arise because of the close communication with between all the individuals. So me being a lawyer helps because people tend to come to me when they have a problem. I tend to identify the deals, sure. but, um, but, but the reality is this. So the fraternity is so small that when we look, when we look around nowadays, as long as you have a credible name, I mean, like yourself, you've been doing it now for a couple of years, you've built it up from scratch. Uh, you've got the track record to prove it. This isn't your first deal. You're not going out to market asking for a couple of million just like that. You've got a track record to prove what you can do if somebody does give you that type of money. And I suppose it comes down to that. So is it an unfair advantage or is it rather the fact that through the years uh, we've been able to build up the credibility that you know allows people to feel a lot more comfortable in approaching and saying, listen, you know what? I've got this problem. So, I mean, for example, I've had clients come to me with half near impossible evictions, but great profits on the property and deciding to actually team up with me to see what I could do as a lawyer within the investment space to help them get rid of the people and actually share an equity in the deal. Um, and obviously they came to me because I'm a lawyer, but they came to me because they knew that I could make it happen. And I suppose that's the same reason people come to you is that if they're going to give you money. They want to know that you can make it work for them. Um, so unfair advantage possibly, or just an advantage through years of doing the same thing or different things and experiencing different clients and actually knowing the field just, just that well, I suppose. Yeah, so, so Bruno, people speak about, you know, you, you're lucky because you got A, B, C, D. Um, and I just want to clarify the point there where I throw out an unfair advantage is that we think that it's luck, but it's actually not. Mm. There have been some time of preparation around this, number Absolutely. one. And you're seeing where it is, or sometimes you're actually creating the opportunity yourself. And then when it comes through, in the world, it, like, it looks like it's unfair, yeah. but you potentially have been digging on this for a minute uh, for it to happen. And when it sprouts, you're mm -hmm. just there to harness it. Um, Absolutely. And it goes back to that second question you had asked me, sorry, was um, what, what's the difference between normal lawyers and a property lawyer? What does it actually take? Yeah. And it's, it's exactly that. The fact that I can recognize a deal, the fact that I can look at my clients with care as entrepreneurs and go, I'm an entrepreneur too. I know these type of deals. I've had 50 clients that have seen this type of deal as well. And these are the experiences that we have. 
Um, I think it all comes down to that. It's, it, it is the hard work. It's putting all the hours behind you and it's being able to identify where things could potentially go wrong and be able to deal with it before they actually do go wrong. Yeah. Bruno, you, you, you practice law, you do deals on your own. And, and the first time that I met you, was actually at, um, at a networking session, and that's the uh, South African Property Investors Network session, SAPIN, as we call it. Um, and back in the days, I think there were just a handful number of people in a room, um, and this thing has just grown on, grown on mm. over the years to become a monster in different cities and things like that. And people are gravitating now onto it, but if I look at it, I, I look at you as one of the pioneers of, of SAP uh, because you are still playing a pivotal role, which is the law component. So you, you, you are the law guy. You know, if we had to call anyone a guy, you are the law, uh, law guy. And you still play a role in it uh, up until to, to, to today. What is the importance of building something like SAP? You have journeyed on it. And you, um, you, 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 you are involved in so many ways around SAPEN. And um, this is actually just a community of like-minded people who are all together, who are meeting from time to time. And earlier on, you spoke about deals now coming through and flowing you know, within that network. Mm. For you as a, as a lawyer uh, or practicing or somebody else who's also doing deals all the time, being involved in networks like these ones, how crucial is it? And you play a leading role, actually, if I look at it, you know. Yeah, thank you. Um, how, how, how important is it? Cool. Well, uh, first of all, thanks for your kind words. I do appreciate that. Um, I can't take credit away from Andrew, though. I mean, yeah, 100%. you can agree with us. It's like the work that he's done in Stefan is incredible. But yeah. I, do appreciate, I do appreciate what you're saying. I have been there for a while. Um, I, and, you know, I've, I've tried to offer as much as possible to try and, and assist SAP and especially from the property law side. Uh, yeah. The reality is with property, law is, uh, is pivotal and it's essential. Um, yeah. So it's one, of those, it's one of those fields where it's not a nice to have service. It's an essential service. It's effectively an essential service for, for property. <laughs> now that we understand um, that word, essential yeah. service. <laughs> uh, maybe the lockdown didn't seem to think so, but yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, so yeah, it, it comes, it comes down to that, like the, yeah. the essential nature of it and the importance of that type of network is it's, it's indescribable. Um, so I'll just give you an example. This is more law related, but I was having a conversation today with one of my colleagues and I don't know if you saw, but we have, um, a property Alliance webinar every Wednesday with yeah. three of the leading firms in, in, in Joburg or Kauteng, Victoria Joburg. We, um, we sit down, we have a chat, we try bounce ideas off each other and we, come, we try to come up with one conclusion as to right. this is actually the situation at the moment and try and tell our clients or prospective clients or just viewers, this is what's happening. And SAPIN achieves that very same result. It's, we're taking a lot of uncertainties, people trying things that don't work or that can't work yeah. and we're, we're allowing them to learn without necessarily having to make those very hard mistakes that you know the likes of us a couple of years ago would have done while we were still learning. Sure, you know, even even with yourself, you've tried things and they've worked, and you didn't have anyone telling you whether it was right or wrong, but you were able and fortunate to do that because of the position you were in, and even being able to bounce ideas before you tried something that somebody might have considered reckless. Uh, you know, you could have been told this and slow down, there might be issues with that. And that's the point of this network is I, I can give advice to an investor. He can come back to me and say, but it doesn't make commercial sense. Um, we can look at a way of conducting a deal or a special way of structuring it and test it out and bring it to market. But if somebody comes to me off the street and decides that they want to go buy a property with difficult tenants, but it's okay, the eviction process, it, the network's there to say, slow down there's going to be issues. Be careful. Are you sure you want to do that? And I suppose that's the importance of the network, the, the Facebook group, the, the networking sessions. 
that's, that's what it teaches you. It lets you learn without having to make those hard mistakes that take you out the game. Because remember, 10, 13 years ago, for instance, when I started practicing, people walked into my office with a deal. And if for some reason the deal didn't work out, they never bought again. It was done. They were over. They decided never to do it again. Too big a risk, too big a loss. They walked away from it. And I'm starting to see within this community that's not happening because people might get into a bad deal, but it's only slightly bad deal because it's the really bad stuff they've learned about before they entered into it. And it gets people going because it's motivational. The fact that, you know what, it's one bad one, but I made, th I made it through, I'm going to the next one. And I think that's the importance. It's education, it's motivation. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I am one of those people, um, you probably don't remember this, this uh, scenario that I'm going to throw at you, but at, at one point I was doing a deal. And this is in my earlier days when I was thinking, you know, having a lawyer is expensive. Um, and I was working with an investor um, and I had read something over the internet. It made sense to me. And I cooked it up in my own document. I sent it through to someone else who was going to give us good money for the, for the project. And eventually it landed up on your deal, on your desk one way or the other. And I remember you calling me, reprimanding me to say, TJ, <laughs> what the hell are you doing? What is this? <laughs> um, but I think that almost kind of like speaks to anyone and everyone who's starting off, who's not seeing the value of the team um, or the power team that we highly speak of. Say so it's important to have those people around. They're there for a reason. Um, and I, when I looked at that particular deal in, in hindsight, obviously with where I am now, I'm thinking, Tara, what the hell were you trying to do? It, it just didn't, to me now, I'm embarrassed even to talk about it or I'm embarrassed even to look at that deal. Attorney client privilege, no, 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 no. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, um, but when I look at that, uh, that particular deal, um, Bruno, you, number one, uh, and, and for me, that was my aha moment of, you know what, um, Bruno have always said that I'm available. And why am I running around or running away from, from what he's offering me to, to be under his wing? And literally, um, from there onward, kind of like all of the complex stuff that we started doing, I would come through and then you'd say, yes, this works, this doesn't work. And, and, and I also don't want to say, well, at all the times did you ever say to me, no, TJ, it works this way, this way. I know in some moments you've said to me, TJ, I want to think about this. Mm -hmm. uh, or I want to consult, or I want to do A, B, C, D. Give me about a week or give me this. Mm -hmm. And out of it, we have then come out with some solid solution that works for that scenario. Absolutely. <clears throat> And to me, that's where I see the, the value of someone like you. You know, I'm not like I'm blowing your horn here. Um, <laughs> but, Go but, ahead, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is the value that I've gotten so far, you know, from, from hanging out with you. Um, and the unfortunate part is that we don't see it when we're starting off. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and when we are... Um, when we get bent, like what we just spoke about on that one particular deal, then all of a sudden this thing doesn't work. Mm. And, and, and we, we, we give in. Having journeyed so far, uh, Bruno, on your journey is 13 years plus now, you're going in. Um, I'm gonna ask of you two things. Sure. The first one is that, um, what is the worst that you have seen? Um, sure. We, we do know that, yes, you have uh, client attorney thingies that you do have, but just give us a scenario of what is the worst that you have seen. That's number one. And what is the good that you have seen in the property space of you just working with people like me? I'm not special. Um, I'm just now special because I've got you, right? Mm. Um, but what have you seen so far? Um. So it's actually, it's actually quite interesting. So I can answer a good and bad uh, yeah. at the same time. And then I've got another good maybe to, to, to uh, just quickly mention to you. Um, yeah. So 
Uh, um, are you referring to like a specific case, for example, or are you referring to the industry as a whole, like how um, how I see the industry and the bad or good in the industry? I think maybe let's zoom it into a specific maybe deal because then that can relate to me as the individual. Absolutely. So um, I'll never forget this deal and I've spoken about it before, but it was just it was so incredible to watch and it was one of the hardest cases that that we dealt with that I keep speaking about it because it will never I still have the file numbers like ingrained in my head they burned into my brain <laughs> and but it was so, so I think it started in around 2010 yeah. uh, the client had purchased a property uh, on the sheriff's auction right and he attended the auction there was talk in the auction like there normally is there's always like always listen to what's happening but don't believe it don't necessarily always believe it because people are also there to try to drive purchases away so they can buy it and get good deals for themselves. So right. he heard there was a bunch of issues. Uh, he was an experienced purchaser and he said, you know what? It's fine. Did he ran his numbers, saw that some of these issues were real, saw that the guy was making a lot of problems and he bought the property. This was a property in a really, really good area. I'm not going to give much details, but in a really good area, but he bought it for next to nothing. I think it was about 1 million or 1.4 million. And it should have been around at that stage, 4 million, somewhere around there. But he knew the guy was causing problems. And I suppose this just speaks to the level of patience that a property investor needs to have. So the client knew what he was getting into. So it's bad in the sense where if I tell you what happened in the case, you'll go, sure, I don't think anyone would really want to survive an ordeal like that. But if you plan for it, it's it, it it worked out amazingly for him because effectively what happened here is the 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 person that previously owned the property was fighting tooth and nail and he didn't have a very good case at all um but by the time i was done i think we had gone through about 24 separate court applications that's about 24 different case numbers different files boxes wow. in my office lined all over the place and this was yeah. just to get the guy evicted and the property was in 2010 then he tried to fight, so everyone stood back, let him fight a little bit. In 2014, client came back and said, well, let's pass transfer now. He's fought, he lost. Um, he passed transfer, guy kept fighting. Effectively, it almost took from 2010 to 2016 to evict the guy, right? Wow. It was, and I mean, it's unheard of. We never, like, I've, an eviction never has to ever taken that long, but these were obviously very special cases like normal clients would have said you know what they don't want to go ahead with this this guy's just too difficult and they wouldn't have had the patience so he let the guy fight stood back took his money back and then paid it back you know that sort of thing yeah. and it took forever but he landed up selling that property if i'm not mistaken for somewhere around six million and if wow. you look at the cost if you look at cost so like the value of money of that one million that he put down for that loan yeah. If you look at the legal costs, which weren't actually that high, and you know, I like outstanding rates, electricity, and things like that, I think he pocketed somewhere around three point five million. Okay. And this was just patience, and he handed the matter over to me, and he said, "Bruno, deal with it," and I dealt with it for him, and he just sat back and he waited. And over those years, he managed to resell the property and there was his profit. And I, I, the, re, the story is very extreme. This never happens. So this yeah. is, people mustn't look at this and go, sure, an eviction can take that long. It doesn't. None of my evictions have taken that long. In fact, uh, that's the only eviction that I remember that has taken me more than a year. Uh, all the other ones have been under. This one was special because we had anticipated and planned to allow that to happen. But I think that's very important, that planning like make sure that you understand what you're in for that you've got provisions to help you survive whatever you're you're actually planning out so even on a smaller deal just make sure that you understand what the deal is about and that you can actually manage the deal good best case scenario and worst case scenario so that's kind of a mixture of both um if i had to look at the good thing on property and this is more not case related but more um to the industry is the number of entrepreneurs and skills development that the property industry has created that I've noticed, especially as entrepreneurs, because people start different businesses, they try to sell things and they don't necessarily go very far. You can actually build a business sometimes on sales without even truly understanding the nature of the business. You just have a product, you 
to get people that want the product to sell it. And that's the knowledge of business that you have. But when it comes to scaling it up, it's very yeah. difficult for those first time entrepreneurs in those type of industries to take it further. Because property is such a big thing, people tend to take it more seriously with a certain level of education and learning. But what people don't realize is that education and learning applies across the board. I do commercial law. So it's, it, it just applies to the guy starting a business down the street, to the guy that runs a, a multinational company. Everything that you guys have learned in your property industry is just as applicable to the next business, to the laundry man. It's, it's really incredible to see how people have developed uh, just by getting into property, even if they haven't had the best deals. Yeah, I like that. Um, you, you're so spot on on that, uh, Bruno. Bruno, for, for anyone who is a lawyer, who's wanting to specialize in property, what is the one tip that you can give them, right? And then for anyone else who is sitting at home and thinking, hmm, I think I can go and make this three million after four years. <laughs> um, and they are wanting to start off in property. What will be the two things that you can give them as tips? Okay. So for the aspiring lawyer, yeah. um, the reality, it's, it's a completely, almost a different conversation to have. Yeah. Because again, now we're going down like the darker path, but the reality <laughs> is, that, yeah, it's, it, it's a lot of work. It's competitive. Sure. It's cutthroat. Yeah. Um, you need to find a way of placing yourself above the rest. And there's always, there's always somebody that, that is right next to you and you're competing with. And now you need to decide to be friends or foe, preferably friends. But the reality is that lawyers are confrontational by their very nature. Or rather, let me rephrase that. The lawyer as a person isn't necessarily confrontational, but the law is. Um, so when you're litigating, when you're negotiating, it's always about this. Ad, we, we study this in law school. We've got an adversarial system. All that means is it's me against you. I am going to try to get the best for my client. You're going to try to get the best for your client. Right. And somewhere, and it's never necessary somewhere in the middle, we'll find a solution. It depends which lawyer works the best for his client. And he gets it closer to his side than the other side. So it is very confrontational by nature. So there are certain um, occupations within the law field that suit people that might not necessarily like that confrontation, which is right. cool. And I mean, that's great. I mean, there's tons of things around estate planning, conveyancing, all that, that stuff is really difficult. It's challenging, but it's not as confrontational. So first of all, be careful. Commercial litigation does sometimes tend to be exhausting. And it does fatigue people and it takes it takes a lot of it takes hours so when you drive by my office and you see the lights on that's either me or my candidate attorney sitting there um seven eight nine ten in the evening i'm up at four in the morning it's the problem is that we need a solution with this amount of facts and we need to get here and somehow we need to condense all of this into one solution that's workable for the client. You need to understand the client's business. You need to understand his mindset. You need to understand his moral values as to what he can, can't, and will, will or won't do. And you need to come with solutions that are workable. Um, so for aspiring lawyers, it's, it's a lot of work. It's rewarding once you get your head around it. But the first yeah. couple of years is draining. It's, uh, you get fatigued. Um, to I, aspiring I, property, yeah. I always say to people that not everything is for everyone. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. But if, if when you find your niche, mm. just give it a Go for it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and if you and have the right tips. mentor, it also helps. Um, okay. What I tend to find is if you want to be an aspiring lawyer, also make sure that you're with the lawyer that you can aspire to be. Um, and that's, that's paramount because if you're with a lawyer that doesn't care or a lawyer that treats you terribly and doesn't really teach you properly, it's, it's not going to help you. It's actually going to drive you in the opposite direction, even though your personality might match, uh, being a lawyer. Okay, cool. Like that. And your two tips to the newbie, someone else who's starting off or someone else who is doing it, but, but they don't have a lawyer. An attorney who is yeah. in a team. What's your two tips around there? 
Um, I think I think both of them are connected uh, connected quite well. So I've always said the thing with property is you learn from your mistakes or you learn from other people's mistakes. Right. So the education component of this stays very very important. Uh, make the education relevant though. A lot of people come with uh, stuff necessary that they've gotten from the U.S. and some principles apply in South Africa, some don't. So yeah. we need to be very very careful um, as to what we try implement that education again becomes paramount getting a coach or getting someone to bounce ideas from really yeah. helps because you have two styles of people you have the guys that close their eyes and go for it and the guys that overthink it and the unfortunate thing is to be a really good property investor you should probably be somewhere in the middle because you want to be able to close your eyes and go for it but after you've spoken to someone that at least guides you in the right points you in the right direction um, right. And you don't want to be overly conservative either because then you'll never do a deal. No deal is ever going to be good enough. There's always a better deal. There's always a better price. There's always something you can negotiate and you destroy deals like that. So at some point you need to just let go and do it. So the education side and the networking side, very, like very, very important. From the law side, it kind of touches on that because the reality is a lot of the stuff that we can help newbie investors with are, are relatively simple. So we don't need, for example, like, you know, me and you have done commercial work together where we've had to set up groups of companies and different companies with uh, different loan agreements and a whole range of things, right? Yeah. But the reality is in your first deal, you don't have to do that. In your first deal, just make sure you're buying in the right place and that you've got an offer to purchase that gives you some room to get out. That's, yeah. that's really the basic that you need. So I think sometimes property investors uh, get too worried and they go, listen, lawyer, let's approach. And then you approach a lawyer and say, I want all of this done. The lawyer says, this is the cost. And you go, sure, I can't afford that. But sometimes that's not really what's necessary. So I suppose also understanding what needs, what you really need is very important. And speaking to a lawyer and going, listen, what do I need in order to make this one deal happen? You know what? Here's a paragraph. Put this paragraph in your OTP, just get the ball rolling with it. And it's not that expensive. And at least you can be a property investor and you can start your journey. And I think that's also kind of important is um, don't be intimidated by the law, but use your network, use your infrastructure to be able to understand what's needed. Because then when you actually approach a lawyer, you know exactly what you need to ask. Uh, and for the unfortunate thing is I, I sometimes have people approaching me um, and then the conversation goes around property strategies and a whole range of stuff that the reality is it's probably cheaper to get a coach to, uh, to sit, uh, sit through because they do group coaching. So they've scaled it. They can sit with you for a couple of hours and explain to you all of that. So can I, but you don't really want to sit one-on-one -on -one with me um, doing all of that. You want to come to me when we need to actually apply those strategies and take the law, take those strategies, and again, bring it into one common place that we can make the deal work. Awesome. I like that. Thanks a lot, Bruno. Um, I'm just sort of jumping into our last segment because me and you, we can talk until tomorrow. Um, but on this last segment, Bruno, um, you, you don't need to think about this. You uh -huh. need to give me the answer as it comes. So sure. on any chill today, where can one find you? Uh, little pizzeria down the street with a bottle of wine. <laughs> Uh, do you have any favorite business book? Um, the most recent one I read, which I enjoyed, was Other People's Money by John Kay. Oh, nice. Yeah. I, I've had a lot of raving around that. I haven't read yeah. it yet. Um, what advice would you give your younger self? <laughs> Take advantage of everything they're teaching in high school because you don't get a second chance at that. So learn as much as you can. Um, yeah. And the last one, Bruno, is what does success look like to you? Being able to choose what challenges, being able to choose what challenges you want to undertake yeah. without, without having the desperation of having to take the challenges because a person needs money or needs income, rather being able to choose the challenges because it's something that your heart desires. That sounds deep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to replay to understand that one. But yeah, thanks Bruno for, for being here. Um, and um, 
we're going to be, for anyone else wanting to reach out to Bruno, um, we're going to put out his links uh, onto the show notes and you can literally reach out to him from anything other than property uh, within the property related space. Um, like literally like what I've said is that if it wasn't for Bruno, you know, probably I could have been somewhere in the docks with the lawsuits and things like that. But Bruno has just helped us in terms of putting all of our contracts together, making sure that we are straight and narrow within the law space. Um, and Bruno, again, thanks on that, of being of service and saving yeah, us right. from time to time. Uh, obviously, it comes with us paying. Um, um, because people are going think, oh, okay, so Bruno does this. You, you, you offer your services for a fee. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, so thanks very much for being here. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it. Uh, like it is any other day on M5 Successful Friends, I bring you a friend who is doing it. And Bruno, not only does he practice law, but he also does the law itself. Um, and over and above that, he is also doing the deals themselves. Um, and if it is someone else that I would like to hang out with someone like him, because I know that he knows the pains from both sides of the story. You know, he's not just helping me from one area of, oh, he's a lawyer, but he knows that obviously when you're putting in some money, there is a return that you're looking for. So obviously he's going to work and protect you to make sure that you're getting that return that you're looking for. Boom, it is I, TJ. We'll catch you on the next episode. Um, and if there is any comments, drop some comments on here. Um, and from time to time, I will run with those questions to Bruno if they are complicated. If they're not, we we'll just respond to them on this channel. Thanks a lot and God bless. Goodbye. Well, thanks, TJ. Cheers, Bruno.